1 p.m. Eastern. So do I. Let's get started. Welcome Wonderful. everyone. Thank you for joining the Recycling Partnership Waste Dive and Resource Recycling today for a webinar on COVID-19 and its impacts on recycling. For those of you on the West Coast, good morning, East Coast, good afternoon, and hello to everyone in between. We are so excited to have 600 people in counting, in counting joining us um, this afternoon, and we're about to break a record for the Recycling Partnership webinar. So thank you so much for joining us for this ever important topic. A few things to get out of the way before we get into the, bone, the meat and the bones of this conversation. PSA, we are recording this webinar. If that goes against your company or community's guidelines about what you can do online, I'll have to ask you to please hop off and make sure to watch our recording, which will be made available along with all of the slides from today's webinar on our website. And you can expect to find that at recyclingpartnership.org slash COVID-19 by end of the week. We're gonna shoot for end of the day tomorrow to get this webinar recording up and live for you all. Today, we're gonna to be using the question and answer feature. On the bottom of your screen, you should see something that looks a bit like this. There's a chat button, a raise hand, and a Q&A. I ask that you not use the chat feature for our webinar today. Instead, we're gonna be using the question and answer button. And this is how it works. You can type your question into the Q&A box and hit send. If you'd like your question to be anonymous, check that little box. We'll reply either by typing back to you in the question and answer window or answering the question live out loud. Cody, introduce us. Thank you, Tricia. Can you hear me all right? Bet. Well, thank you for that. And welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for being here with us. My name is Cody. I lead the community granting and engagement for the Recycling Partnership. I'm here with Tricia, who will be supporting the webinar behind the scenes, the Q&A, and we'll be presenting communications BMPs a little later on. Uh, we know this certainly is an unnerving time for all of us. There are many things we still do not know. We will not be able to answer some of them on this webinar. Um, however, we're gonna to explore topics and do the best we can to make this as informative as we can. We invited Cole and Colin, whose publications have done a fantastic job keeping their finger on the pulse of, of the recycling industry and the impacts of COVID-19 over the past few weeks. During the first part of the, our hour together, I'm gonna to ask uh, Colin and Cole some questions. Trisha's then going to share some BMPs for communicating to residents, and then we're going to open up the uh, uh, Q&A to the audience using the Q&A function that Trisha just um, let us know about. But before we start, uh, I do want to take time to thank many of you who have gone into work every day to make sure our recycling and solid waste continues to be collected and processed. I also uh, like to thank your drivers and the individuals on the sort lines who are out there every day getting the job done. You're having difficult uh, conversations with your staff and difficult conversations with your leadership and we certainly do appreciate it. You're obviously providing an important service to your community, but also continuing to keep the recycling plate uh, supply chain moving forward. With that, I'd like to introduce the two panelists. Cole Rosengren is, a, is the senior editor of Waste Dive and Colin Straub, Senior Reporter from Resource Recycling. I'd like to ask both of them to do quick introductions and overviews, and then we'll get into some Q&As. So we'll start with Cole. Take it away, Cole. Thank you, Cody. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. And um, yeah, thank you to, again, as Cody said to everyone who's listening, who's uh, working during this time, we greatly appreciate it. And uh, it's more essential than ever. I've been asked just to give a quick um, overview of what we've been seeing over the last few weeks. Um, it's obviously been a, a disorienting and challenging time for all of us. Um, and on Waste Dive, we're certainly not alone in that we, uh, within the last couple of weeks, made the decision that this is, you know, almost entirely what we uh, need to be focusing on. And we're seeing record high engagement from our readers as a result. It's clear people need good information right now. And uh, we're happy to do our part in that. Um, so just in terms of what we've been tracking high level, um, during the week of March 8th, we saw what I believe to be the first um, curbside recycling program suspension announcement that was in Athens, Alabama. Of course, saw many uh, conferences get uh, canceled or rescheduled. 
uh, started to see the first wave of communications from um, haulers and other service providers. Um, it was kind of early in the beginning and now they're becoming much more uh, detailed about what they're asking folks to do and we'll talk about that later. Um, and then also that week, a study came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, which has caught many of people's attention and I know we'll be talking about that later as well about um, whether the, uh, the coronavirus, uh, the novel coronavirus can live on certain surfaces, cardboard and plastic uh, for certain periods of time. Uh, the week of March 18th was when we saw Department of Homeland Security uh, designate waste collection as an essential service. Later saw um, updates to that guidance that includes um, recycling services as well. So uh, another long list of uh, recycling program suspensions, many uh, collection change policies, drop off policies. Um, also very notable that week was updated guidance from OSHA. Uh, previously, OSHA had not clarified uh, safety guidance for solid waste as well as recycling activities. It was um, only uh, referencing medical waste and that was a, a problem. And again, I know we'll be talking about that later as well, what that guidance looks like. Last week, uh, there's really heightened attention to worker safety, seeing a ton of local news stories, a lot of questions and concerns about that and rightfully so. Um, many more program suspensions, um, continuing push for essential service designation at the state level, which I believe has happened now in many states. I haven't uh, checked the list recently, uh, but I know that remains a big priority for trade groups and companies, of course. And this week, uh, who knows? Uh, we cannot begin to guess what will happen this week. One thing uh, I'm sure we've all learned and I'm finding in my conversations with folks is we don't, uh, any, anything we talk about is good as of uh, this moment and perhaps even five minutes ago. We do not know where things are heading and how this will evolve. So we'll be watching to see what comes, comes up this week. Um, and in terms of things we are uh, looking ahead to on Waste Dive, you can um, follow along every day, Monday through Friday, we're updating our waste recycling impact tracker with uh, relevant news we find online. Uh, we appreciate any reader uh, tips and emails, of course, um, as well as our own reporting that we're putting into there. Things we'll be looking at next are, um, safety for collection workers and MRF sorters. We touched on that in the, you know, earlier this month, but we have a new wave of, um, you know, reporting and questions coming up about that. So we'll be looking at what that means. Uh, continuity plans for service um, at various levels of the supply chain. Uh, you know, the companies obviously have and municipalities have these plans in place, but uh, I've had to really update them and rethink how they can continue uh, you know, doing this essential service when the workforce may become ill or folks need to stay home for a variety of reasons. Also, I'm very interested in tracking the volume shift from uh, commercial uh, over to residential, seeing a ton of um, news stories and getting reports about that from haulers as well. And then finally, um, we'll also be exploring uh, what this may mean for contractual relationships at the municipal level, whether uh, force majeure is getting invoked and, uh, you know, how folks are going to work together during this time. And so with that, I'll just leave it there. Please feel free to get in touch anytime. Uh, my email is here on the slide and also available on our website. And if you haven't already, um, please consider signing up for our free daily newsletter at wastedive.com. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I'll throw it over to Colin now. Yeah, thanks, Cole. Um, and I share your sentiment. I hope everyone is uh, staying safe, staying well, getting through this as best we can, uh, wherever you are. Um, like everyone, you know, we were reading about the coronavirus since the beginning of the year, uh, looking into the economic impact, particularly of the shutdown in China. And it seemed like another potential hurdle in the overseas markets, I would say early on, but obviously in the last few weeks, the impact has extended far beyond that and is now kind of hitting every part of the world, uh, likely impacting everyone on this webinar in one way or another. Uh, so Cole gave a great timeline, you know, of when these changes started taking place in the States, uh, some of the some of the major events that we've seen, I would say I, I'd just like to comment on why we think these collection changes matter. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see some of the uh, headlines we have we have run um, and some of the reaction that that we're seeing around the country. Um, I've gotten some feedback that you know, as Cole mentioned, it's sort of every resource in reporting right now is going into covering how the coronavirus is impacting this industry. I've gotten some feedback that, you know, maybe we're making too much of it or making too big of a deal of it. It's temporary. It won't have a lasting impact. Uh, I would say every day that passes indicates more and more that this is a huge deal to the extent that it's impacting, you know, day-to-day -day life in a way that we really haven't seen in many years, uh, maybe generations. And, you know, by proxy, it's impacting the recycling industry. 
uh, specific to recycling and kind of where we're at. Um, oh, are we getting, someone can't hear me? Anyone getting that feedback? You, you sound great. Okay, keep, I will go yeah. with the message. Um, yeah, the, we have a lot of, just as a quick um, interruption here, Colin, we have a lot of people, over a thousand people on the, on the webinar, which is so fantastic. And so individual internet connections might go in and out. And um, so we'll just, we'll keep going. And Colin, I'll let you know if I can't hear you. Everybody on this webinar in the audience is on mute. So um, just to let you know, we're getting a few questions like that. So go ahead, Colin, take it away. Gotcha. Uh, specific to recycling, this is, I would say, coming in the wake of what we've already been calling a crisis for two plus years. Um, you know, the loss of major markets for recyclables and subsequent shifts industry wide that we've seen. Uh, we've, we're coming on the heels of contract renegotiations, as, as Cole touched on, uh, and possibly looking at future ones, raising prices, arguably shifting the cost revenue model for recycling nationwide. Um, Lots of municipal programs have adjusted their lists of the materials they accept, have settled into sort of a new normal uh, recycling. You know, everyone knows it's been attacked in the public eye as not penciling out, not being viable, et cetera. And now in the wake of those messages, we have another impact. People aren't going to see their recycling getting collected or they're going to hear about shifts and, and companies maybe, you know, suspending operations. So I, I would argue that if there was any doubt, I would say this does matter. Uh, the only point that is up in the air is the specific impacts and the extent of those impacts related to the collection suspensions and some of the market strife that we're going to see. Uh, so I was going to get into some of the impacts on our next slide here that, that I sort of see uh, the possibility of coming about. But I think this is kind of what we're going to be discussing on the rest of the webinar. So Cody, if I, I could just end here and we can kind of get into this discussion um, or I can kind of walk through some of these. We're going to get into these. Um, if you want to hit some high level stuff to make sure we, we touch on, we can definitely do that. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially the concerns of the, the supply disruptions, you know, if we suspend collection programs, if we scale things back, uh, that, you know, likely leads to less material coming into the stream. And if it gets, you know, on, on a big enough level, it could be a significant hit in terms of the supply of recyclables. We have cost increases, uh, as Cole mentioned, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, haulers are having to adjust their services. They're seeing higher costs. We're seeing a shift in where material is coming in through the stream. So all those things are associated with uh, cost shifts and, and possible increases. Who's going to shoulder that burden? Uh, that remains to be seen. A uh, wider economic downturn, you know, a lot of analysts are, are sort of forecasting we may be entering a recession, kind of too early to say just yet, but things have definitely been in a uh, downturn on the stock market. Uh, seen sort of a lot of pressure in the last few weeks and how does that impact recycling you know recycling sort of follows the the economy if people are buying less material and, and less uh, consumer goods then possibly less material is coming into the stream into the recycling stream and then end market expansions this is uh, just sort of something I'm wondering about I don't have any any real data on this yet but you know we're I'm hearing about construction, slowdowns, a lot of just economic activity grinding to a halt. I've, Cole and I have both been writing pretty significantly in the last couple of years about end market development, uh, you know, multi hundred millions of dollars of, of mill investment, paper mills, plastics processing facilities. Some of those, there's already been skepticism of when, whether they're gonna come about. Um, how does that look under a potential recession? Uh, I, I don't know. That's that's just a thought that I had and don't want to be too cynical, but, uh, you know, I think it, it bears a question. So um, that's it for me. This is we are also uh, you know, we have kind of a special section of our website dedicated to our coverage of this. because It's going to be ongoing and uh, the impacts are, you know, more and more every day. So uh, feel free to email me if you have any info, any questions, uh, but I'm interested to, to get the, kind of the wider discussion here. So. Thanks, Cody. Thanks, Colin. And while I'm asking questions, you are fading in and out with your sometimes. So I don't know if you have a cord or a head, headset that might be able to. I to do. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just start with uh, Cole as Colin's working on that. Um, thank you both for that overview. And we are seeing schedule changes and um, temporary suspensions to, to curbside programs and drop off programs. Cole, what um, what are you seeing? The reasons are for those for those um, kind of 
changes in, in schedule or in temporary suspensions. Um, yeah, I'm seeing a range of um, kind of rationale provided for that. The, the main one seems to be, um, first and foremost, worker safety concerns, um, you know, in terms of uh, workers interacting with the public at drop-off sites, as well as um, there has been some, you know, question about um, transmission from uh, workers touching material. And again, we, you know, I think we'll get into that more about uh, that's not entirely proven out and that, you know, the use of good PPE should be a guard against that, but I am seeing that come up a lot as a reason. Um, but I think, and that would go for the MRFs as well. Sometimes it goes downstream, you know, if the MRF is not able to operate at full capacity or maybe it's closing entirely, that's going to affect your collection, of course. Um, but the other factor, and I think this is probably underlying all of these decisions in some way, it's just an operational consideration. Even if the workforce is not reduced currently, um, there's a concern that it could be in the future due to either you know, the workers themselves getting sick, having to stay home to care for someone who's sick, or also childcare factors with um, schools and daycares being closed. So I think it's a combination of those two. So I'm hearing, that's, and that's exactly what we're hearing as well. So I'm hearing uh, kind of the health and safety issues, number one, and then it's becoming a, and just labor shortages with the reasons you, you answered that. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. You're seeing the same thing at MRFs as well? So far, yeah, and um, we're actually, I'm working on something about that um, for you this week or next week. We have, yeah, seen at least a few MRFs um, close up entirely or, you know, really limit operations and others are, um, you know, operating at lower capacity because of um, social distancing guidelines that, you know, uh, necessitate spacing things out in the sort line and yeah, other factors like that. Right, yeah. And so with the health and safety, um, Colin, are you, are you back? Maybe we can hear you a little better. Yeah, yeah, and, and hopefully the, the microphone is working now. Great, it sounds great right now. So um, I'll let you know if we, if, if we hear otherwise. Um, so the, okay, here's my question. The, the question about the health and safety, and we're getting this a lot. Um, David Bitterman of, of Swan, uh, Swan asked this question too in the Q&A here, that um, regarding the, the virus actually being on material, living on material, um, are you seeing any sort of uh, scientific or valid sources that are talking about this to really give us guidance um, uh, regarding the virus being on material or the duration in which virus, the virus might live on material? And the material I'm talking about is plastic, aluminum, glass, paper products, et cetera. Right. Yeah. And, and Cole mentioned this in his intro. Um, we have seen there was a study by the National Institutes of Health, CDC, um, and a couple of like UCLA was involved. They collaborated on a study of how long the coronavirus can live on surfaces. And uh, from, from what I recall, they found the virus was, uh, you know, they could find it uh, up to four hours on copper, uh, 24 hours on cardboard, and up to two or three days on plastic and stainless steel. Uh, that's that's the notes I took about that, and it was detectable in aerosols, um, you know, for up to three hours. So, uh, the material, the the copper, mostly the cardboard, plastic, stainless steel, uh, that has big implications for household recycling. If, if the material is, you know, getting put in the curb at the curb and then and it enters a MRF, you know, in, in less than twenty four hours, um, yeah, that that could be a, um, a potential transmission of the disease. So, so there has been some study about that. I've also seen, just anecdotally, I saw a couple um, articles in the media about the cruise ships. They were finding that the virus could live for even longer than that on, on some surfaces. I, I don't have that information right in front of me, but th there, so there is, people are looking into this and there has been at least um, one, I would say, pretty reputable study about this that shows it does in fact live on materials for some period of time. And, and Cole, anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, and I will, um caveat that I haven't fully run down the study, but it was actually just flagged to me um, right before we got online by one of our contributors. Apparently, there's a new study out in the uh, Journal of Hospital Infection um, that has some uh, new data about the virus living on plastic, among other materials, so it may be worth folks looking into. Um, the only other thing I'd add is um, we, at least in my mind, have not gotten a definitive, an definitive answer that this is a concern yet um, from A, the trade associations, um, SWANA, NWRA, ISRI, you know, they are in many cases speaking to, or rather pointing to um, WHO, CDC, and OSHA guidelines. Um, and OSHA, and I've asked them this repeatedly, not getting 
a full or clear response in my opinion, but they do not consider it uh, a factor in the guidance they've put out and updated about um, recycling handling. Um, and the same goes for some of the industry's larger companies. I know um, uh, waste management in particular, large MRF operator, has been telling me they do not consider uh, waste, you know, a disease pathway, uh, also pointing to these sources for that reasoning. All right. So, so to the questions out there of, of, with this, I think we're actively searching for, for the right information. There are a few good resources I'm hearing from the two of you. And then how to communicate that to your staff, to David's question, um, is, is hard, right? You have to provide them with all the information you have, show them the resources uh, that, you've, that you've found, and give them the proper PPE, because we do want all these folks to be safe. So um, just really being uh, earnest and genuine with the staff is, is my best recommendation, because it does seem like there's not one definitive source of exactly what happens quite yet. It's, it's a moving target in how we understand this. Um, I kind of want to move to the, I, it, this was already mentioned, hot, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important topic, it's, it's essential service, and recycling being an essential service. ISRI provided talking points uh, for recycling as an essential service, those, those were great for us, um, and the industry should, should check them out. And then SWANA actually has a template, it's a letter of access for essential uh, critical infrastructure workers, um, as they are essential, uh, essential staff. So uh, I think we all want to make sure recycling is, can, it stays, uh, stays essential. I know counties in North Carolina are specifically calling out recycling as essential service to keep workers out there and keep things being collected. Are the both, are, so I'll just start with Cole. Are you hearing um, that cities are able to, to keep recycling as an essential service? So I guess I'll say cities in MRFs. Is that, a, is it that kind of a constant topic and what are they saying about it? Yeah, so this is one where I um, will admit to not having full information, but my understanding is a lot of this is flowing um, from the state level is, you know, what is often forming cities, uh, you know, when they're making these decisions. And, you, you know, even if it's not necessarily um, being classified as essential, I have not seen any city deem it non-essential so far. Um, you know, they're all very clear that they want the service to continue, want these facilities to continue. Um, and to my knowledge, the handful of MRFs that we know of that have closed down um, have done so of their own volition. It is not anything to do with, um, you know, a lack of being deemed essential. Yeah. Colin, anything to add to that? Yeah, I would say the designation has, I mean, in every state that I have read through their order, it's a lot of them are going off the uh, DHS, you know, the federal guidance, which isn't a court's binding, but if the states adopt that into their executive order, then that's what they're going under. And, and that federal guidance does include kind of general solid waste services as a whole, um, which many are interpreting to include recycling. Some states have, you know, specifically included recycling operations. And you mentioned North Carolina. Uh, that's an important distinction. I would say it also, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that those businesses will stay open if, you know, if there is other factors that, that are, you know, giving them trouble. Uh, it just means they're not, they're not ordered to stop. That's my understanding. Um, cause we're still seeing some, you know, smaller rural recycling programs that are really hurting, uh, and, and shutting down or, or slowing down amid this, even in States where, as I said, most States are designating this as an essential service. So I would say it's not a guarantee that, that things are going to move forward, but it doesn't, it means they're not ordered to, to stop and, and not come into work. And so as you guys are tracking what's happening out there, how many, are, are you aware of, of MRFs? Well, I, I guess I'm aware of MRFs that are temporarily suspending service. How many out there are we aware of? Um, Colin, I'll start with you. Do you know? Um, I mean, I've seen, you know, reports here and there. I would say I, I would hesitate to put a specific number on it because things are, are changing so fast. Uh, I think no matter what I say, it would probably be wrong. Um, so, so I don't have a specific number of MRFs or uh, community suspensions. All I have is kind of the growing list that I'm keeping of, of what, I've, what I've seen out there. Um, so I wouldn't want to give a definitive answer there. Uh, Cole, what are you seeing? I know that you're, you're tracking it closely also. Do you, I know it's definitely going to change uh, after today because it's a moving target, but any, any sense? Yeah, um, so same thing. I don't have a hard number, but the ones I am aware of um, that have, you know, uh, really limited operations or perhaps shut down entirely. Uh, there's a MRF in York County, South Carolina, Kent County, Michigan, 
And then also uh, Athens Services, a California company, um, has seems to have largely um, stopped hand sorting at some of their MRFs. Uh, I'm still trying to get information on whether that means operations are continuing, you know, in partial form or how many MRFs even that includes. Um, and then beyond that, I am aware of some MRFs that just are doing less volume in part because, hey, maybe there's less volume coming in, but also because, you know, they're not able to process as much. Um, so, yeah, I'd say it's a small, but likely to grow number from there. Mm -hmm. Any schedule? So, like, are you hearing any schedule changes for collection or, or operating hours for, for MRFs and, like, how they might be talking about schedule changes? Um, on the collection side, we have seen a few... Um, city programs, uh, sometimes in partnership with, you know, private, private companies that are doing collection earlier sometimes um, as a, a way to, you know, limit interaction with the public or maybe space out shifts so that the, uh, the workers are not congregating as much at the garage. Um, I haven't heard about that happening as much on the MRF side, but I would not be surprised if it has. Um, and then I think we're going to touch on this more later, but we have seen, you know, uh, at this point, dozens of um, curbside recycling suspensions as well. And, and, of the the suspensions of curbside last at the end of last week we only saw about 20 is that it's probably a little more now the curbside temporary suspensions uh, to my knowledge it's yeah more, more in the 30 range now but again i think that number um is honestly probably uh, undercounted uh, yeah, we hope it's not i don't know but um i get the sense that there's a fair amount of communities that either have already started or are considering um you know continuing collection and maybe not even necessarily notifying residents of a change but that the material won't always be getting, getting processed on a day-to-day -day basis just depending on their kind of abilities on the back end so i think there's maybe some that we're just not aware of that that's happening right that makes that makes sense to me and and regarding the schedule changes we've been working with a lot of our community partners and, and uh, cities and states out there and if you're if it's a real labor shortage what is the possibility of getting out there and uh, temporarily changing or uh, how you know the frequency in which you collect drop-offs um, there's a lot of different varieties of scheduling to change up before just temporary suspending. So we're always exploring those ideas. If people have uh, best best in class ways to kind of quickly change up a schedule, let us know on the side and we can start putting that information out. Um, so uh, just switching gears from the single family type stuff, are we are you seeing any uh, impact to multifamily and commercial collections? Cool, I'll start with you. Uh, yeah, I don't actually have any good information on multifamily, so I'd be you know, glad to hear if Colin has anything or if any of the, the listeners have anything. On the commercial side, um, limited information, I'd say, but from talking to um, folks over the past week or so, first story um, we put out today, actually, about effects um, on commercial waste and recycling, we are definitely hearing um, that even if service continues, you know, volumes are greatly reduced uh, because so many businesses are closed in certain cities, and in some cases, um, you know, it depends on what state or local regulations require in terms of if recycling has to happen or if it's rather, you know, a voluntary action. But if volumes are down so much, um, routes are being reduced, uh, routing is being changed. And I know um, New York City, for example, has come up as an area where, you know, volumes are down dramatically. Um, and the sense, again, this is not, you know, confirmed, but it seems like uh, local enforcement is not the top priority, let's say, for the city right now to ensure that, you know, recycling is happening there they're being um, flexible, recognizing that not everyone's going to have the ability or the time to do this right now. Um, so I think, yeah, there's probably a fair, there's some still happening, obviously good clean cardboard, you know, coming out of grocery stores and other, other areas, but I think commercial recycling is pretty quiet in certain cities right now. And, and Colin, any, anything to add there? You might be on mute. But the, it, as a response to that, Cole, it, it's going to be fascinating to see how commercial tons and volume has, are changing over to, to residential. I think that's an interesting topic. And while, while there are kind of labor stresses in the collection of recyclables, more people are home and volumes seem to be increasing. So um, we're always interested in, in, in finding, um, finding opportunities to, to help these cities navigate that. Oh, that was Colin that was speaking. Cool. Anything, any follow up on that? I asked Colin. So I think we got our wires crossed. That was me speaking, actually. This is Cole. Ha! It's good to have three people, Cody, Colin, and Cole, all CEOs, trying to navigate this. Okay, I'm going to move on to another question. Um, so this is 
this is a really hard question. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming we don't know the answers, but for the programs that have suspended temporarily, do you have, are there any sense of when they think they can come back to a regular service? It just seems like it's so varied out there. Either of you, um, Colin, I'll start with you, Colin, you. We may have lost Colin, actually. Colin, are you on mute? Cool, how about you? Sure, um, so as far as I've seen, um, I don't know off the top of my head, I have seen a few dates floated you know, in certain cities, um, but my sense is those dates are probably not hard and fast as they're not with a lot of things, you know, in terms of um, how long business closures will last. So for the most part, I think folks are being pretty um, intentionally vague and probably smartly so, you know, with when these things will return. Yeah. So it, right now, the majority of residential programs are still running as well as MRFs. What adjustments, you mentioned some adjustments already, but like specifically to kind of hone in on that a little bit, what adjustments are you seeing in terms of keeping those MRFs open and collection going? Cool. Yeah, so a big one I've heard is, um, you know, step one is ensuring uh, good social distancing, uh, you know, protocol on the sort lines. Um, you know, these are obviously uh, work, work environments where folks can be pretty close together sometimes, you know, sometimes even shoulder to shoulder, depending on the configuration. So making sure everyone's six feet apart, um, which may mean, you know, uh, slowing down volumes as well, because you're maybe not able to um, do as much hand sorting for certain streams. Uh, and then basic stuff that we're hearing, which would apply to really any Workplace is um, trying to stagger uh, breaks, you know, trips to the bathroom, um, punch in procedures, you know, so there's really no um, kind of a no touch situation. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, one uh, facility I spoke to recently said they're actually um, kind of uh, trying to hold material, so to speak, when it comes in, um, partially just to give themselves a little more uh, time to, you know, process things and also um, to alleviate any worker concerns. So if a load comes in, Maybe it sits uh, in the corner of the floor for a day, perhaps even two, if you know it's deemed safe to do so. So if there's any concerns about the virus living on there, that maybe those are um, reduced. And I think day to day, again, you know, outside of states where there are guidelines for uh, you know waistbands and things, um, I think day to day, what what's being sorted for may just have to change depending on what uh, how much labor is available. And obviously, uh, you know, uh, market demand as well. You know, one day maybe uh, you hand sort the mixed plastics. One day maybe uh, that's not your priority is what I'm hearing. Yeah. So we, I think we have uh, Cole back. Are you there? Uh, Colin, yeah. Sorry Colin. about that. The joys of uh, working at home. Internet completely died. So uh, my apologies. No problem. Glad you're, glad you're here. Um, I'm going to get back into the question. One question I have for, for, for Cole and then uh, Colin for you to follow up on is we know that uh, the – as we're talking about already, that the human health and safety is number one, but there are the labor shortages, like we're talking about. Are haulers and MRFs doing anything to incentivize labor to continue working or support the labor that may need to, t to spend time away from work to support their families? Are uh, any, any MRFs or haulers do anything special that you would want to share with this um, on this webinar? It's a great question and one I would love to know more about, honestly. So if there's any folks listening um, who want to share what they're doing, uh, I would be glad to hear that. I don't know of a ton. I've seen a few uh, anecdotal examples about um, hourly pay being temporarily increased uh, in certain markets, but nothing definitive, you know, to be able to share. Uh, I have definitely seen a lot of talk about um, revisiting paid leave policies. Um, you know, differs a lot, of course, depending on if you're um, in the private sector, or the public sector, um, whether you're a union member, there's a lot of considerations there. Um, but I, we have seen uh, both the two largest MRF operators uh, on the private side, of course, Waste Management and Republic have, um, you know, put out new guidance about their leave policies, and I believe adjusted their policies to um, try to be more accommodating. And my sense is um, city employees are working through some of those questions right now as well. Yeah. Colin, any follow up? No, I would agree. Um, I haven't, that's another issue. We haven't really delved into that side of it uh, as much. I would be interested to learn more though. Great. So kind of moving on, Cole, I have an, another question for you. Waste Dive recently ran a story about uh, COVID-19 as it relates to deposit states. Talk to us about the, the impact of COVID-19 um, on the deposit system. Yeah, so what we uh, found is that in um, eight of the 10 states with um, bottle bills, uh, there have been changes um, 
you know, new guidance uh, around enforcement. It ranges, and I would um, point folks to uh, Container Recycling Institute. Actually, has done a great job of rounding this up on their website. Uh, and you can find that, I believe, right on their homepage about, you know, links to all the various orders. But generally, it seems to be a mix of um, suspending requirements and enforcement um, for retailers specifically. You know, as we know, there's a lot of grocery stores um, that often have uh, reverse, reverse vending machines or other redemption centers. And given the strain on grocery stores right now, um, that's being relaxed. Uh, and in some states, there's also... Um, some drop-off um, centers closing, particularly in California, we've seen that. And I think Colin can speak to that. They've done some good reporting on that too. Um, but yeah, so far eight of the 10 have come out to essentially say this is, you know, they'll ease up requirements on that. As of, as of now, um, the two that we don't have any information from yet are California and Hawaii, to my knowledge. We're, we're um, really starting to dig in and analyzing the, the impact on supply due to the deposit states, um, as well as the curbside, the temporary curbside suspensions that may be out there. Um, we might not have time to dig into that uh, on this. We're having a ton of questions coming in, which is exciting. And um, so I'll kind of hold on the supply questions for now, but would like to ask you, Colin, um, it, it kind of look. It looks like that China and European markets. I just saw an article from from you about the European markets and, and their impact. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the what the current global markets look like because of COVID nineteen? <clears throat> yeah, definitely. And and as I mentioned, this kind of our our following this kind of started with China, and and it's an interesting time for that because there was obviously a massive uh, manufacturing slowdown in China over the past few months, and now we're we're sort of seeing the economy start back up. I read um, in the Wall Street Journal that I think about 90% of industrial manufacturing is, is up and running again. The big paper companies, Nine Dragons, Lee and Man, the, the ones we follow, they were hit pretty hard over the past, past few months. Uh, big production cuts, slowdowns. I heard about an interesting trend. There was so little collection of local uh, recycled paper, waste paper happening during the slowdown that Chinese mills were increasing buying of recovered paper from other countries. Um, but that gets into another hurdle, which has kind of defined the global impact as far as trade goes, that of the shipping situation. I think a lot of people know about the shipping relationship, you know, between the U.S. and China. New goods shipped to the U.S., recyclables uh, shipped back. Um, even with the ban restrictions over the past couple of years, that still takes place with some recovered materials. Uh, but under the lockdown and manufacturing slowdown in China that that massively disrupted the flow of, of those container ships. We heard about, you know, vessels were unable to enter or leave ports, stranded containers, um, which obviously causes major disruption, skyrocketing shipping costs. I had one, one source told me that, you know, the freight rate has tripled um, for shipping from the UK over to Hong Kong, just an example, over the past three months. And now, of course, it's not you know, it's obviously not just China anymore at this point. They're they're moving back towards sort of starting things up or, or slowly getting back towards some amount of uh, normalcy. But now we have major lockdowns across the world, um, including in other downstream outlets for U.S. recyclables. We were just I've been looking into this past week, and we reported today on Malaysia, which is still a major buyer of scrap plastic. They have a lockdown in place, essentially uh, shutting massive amount of industry in that country. India has a 21 day lockdown in place. Um, ISRI is reporting heavy impacts to US exports of scrap materials in India. Similar to China, there's you know chaos at the ports, ships unable to unload materials. It's it, hard to say how what kind of impact that'll have on paper and plastic because we've seen uh, pretty, pretty strict restrictions on uh, imports of those materials into India over the past year, so they may not be quite as impacted. But all this adds essentially another global market hurdle in, you know, the wake of a major global market hurdle we've seen uh, with China and other Asian markets sort of backing out of the, the industry. Uh, and then throw in, you know, the recent turmoil with the oil markets, uh, prices plummeted, there was a whole disagreement between OPEC and Russia over oil production cuts. And tanking oil prices, of course, will have substantial implications for scrap plastic markets forcing down prices, uh, as you know, recyclers are they have to compete with prime plastics. So uh, it definitely sort of a, uh, it's, it's, it's complicated. There's a lot of things going on, but uh, it's, you know, it's adding on top of an already sort of disrupted global market for scrap materials, I would say. 
Well, I'm certainly looking forward to kind of following uh, both of you as, as you're finding out more information. We at the Recycling Partnership are certainly at, uh, you know, doing our analysis and understanding what, what effects this might have on the supply chain. Um, and I think this type of forum to communicate about this is going to be really important in the near future. So appreciate your, your insight to that. I do want to get to questions from our um, participants, but before we get to the questions, uh, I kind of want to end on a, on a question for both of you to stay maybe on a, on a higher positive note here that we, we're all part of this recycling system, the three of us, um, all the people participating on the webinar today. What's the most important storyline you think we should be paying attention to to ensure we maintain a healthy recycling system on the other side of this? What are, what are some things we should really be um, kind of top of mind as we're, as we're working through this together? Uh, Colin or Cole, I'll start with you. Sure, I would say um, for me, one of the things top of mind, and we've touched on this a lot, is um, the worker safety angle, worker health and safety, um, obviously, a uh, top priority for folks of all, all, all types in this industry. And I know people are working really hard on that. I would say there's um, room for even more transparency and even more attention to this issue. We've seen a lot of great coverage in local media, probably more in the last two or three weeks about, you know, collection workers uh, than we've seen in a long time. Um, but I do still get the sense that folks are being guarded and I, I get it. I totally understand why you don't want to report having a case or report that your facility maybe can't operate at full capacity, but I think now it's the time to be more transparent than usual, perhaps, um, to help everyone work through this together. Because we know this is gonna affect just about everyone in one way or another. Um, and so, yeah, that would, that would be the main note I would hit right now. And that's something we're looking at in the weeks ahead. Thanks, cool. Colin? Yeah, I would, I mean, I'd obviously echo worker safety. Um, that's, that's paramount importance. I, I also think I'd like to go back to the essential definition. This is. In, in some ways, an opportunity to reiterate that fact that you know recycling is an essential service. Even if we see collection cut or suspended in certain communities, uh, I, I do think first that's that's temporary, um, but also that will illustrate the value of recycling when people stop seeing that picked up. You know that that reminds them, oh yeah, this is kind of an important part of uh, everyday life that maybe they don't think about that much, but when it stops, then it's all the more noticeable. Um, and I, I think just one little anecdote that I read about recently in all the communities that we've seen scaling back or suspending service, uh, there was at least one that I saw where, I mean, literally the next day they reversed it based on you know, opinion from the public. It was sort of a thing of, of reallocating resources into other departments. And there was so much sort of outcry about what stopping recycling that, you know, they, they found a way to, to keep it going. So I don't know that that's possible everywhere, but, but it's, that's an interesting message. Well, I appreciate you saying that. And I think just keeping both of you kind of the, the importance of sharing information and being as transparent as, as we possibly can as we're trying to figure out how to work through this. Uh, the Recycling Partnership is going to continue to put timely information out through our channels um, and for our community and state partners. Uh, our webinars like this, we're going to keep doing our newsletters. We have a community face. Facebook group for uh, recycling coordinators and then all of our digital uh, or our social platforms will keep up-to-date information um, and you guys uh, your publications as you've noted will keep uh, information up to date and an important thing that you said Colin is like how to communicate about this because it is temporary it's going to be important to connect with residents so here briefly I'm going to um, call on uh, Trisha to, to jump in and share a couple best a few best management practices in a time like this when you're trying to share pertinent information to your residents and then we're going to open up the floor in the last 15 minutes to, to discuss uh, to, to answer the questions from the participants. Uh, Trisha. Thanks, Cody. Here's what we do know about residents here in the U.S. More than 84% of Americans view recycling as a valuable public service. So the best thing that you can do during this time is to keep your community updated through all of your channels. Make sure to be using your community's hashtags as well as COVID-19. And if you'd like to join in the Recycling Partnerships conversation, use the hashtag Recycling Matters. This will help your residents call and see all of the information available for them right now. If your services are continuing as is, so heads up to our community program coordinators, here are some talking points for you, for your community. Again, these will all be available on recyclingpartnership.org this week. They were also in our newsletter that was released last Thursday. 
If you don't get our newsletter, you can sign up at the bottom of our webpage. Recycling is important to our community and our planet. Make sure to tell them that it is an essential service. Since, since you are continuing your collection and people have some time at home these days, make sure that they know what is and what is not recyclable in their neighborhood and in their community. And again, make sure to tell them to check out your social media feeds and your website for more information on the status of your service during this time. If, oh, and most importantly, Cody, we added this today. If, you're, if your communication, and excuse me, if your program is continuing, please ensure you're telling your residents to keep their material in the cart. We're seeing this as one of the most important talking points that we can put out to communities across the country right now. To keep drivers safe, keep your material in the cart. Drivers will no longer be able to get out of their trucks to collect the materials outside of the cart. Cody, do you wanna to touch on this at all and what you've seen or heard? I, I really appreciate you putting this up here. I just think it's a, it's a really important topic right now where, uh, drivers are out there, they're going to stay out there, but we might need to really hit on the, the rules of recycling um, here, more important now than ever. That, and so this is like a, a really quick and easy way to remind your residents that your drivers won't be getting out to collect stuff outside the cart. Um, you might have other restrictions. There's going to be more cars on the road uh, that are parked on the side of the road. So your drivers are going to, you might need to just hone in on some specific rules and this is a great way to do it. So thanks. Thanks awesome. for sharing. If you are currently seeing scheduling changes within your recycling program, make sure to communicate to your residents that you've made this difficult decision and then where they can find the most up-to-date information. So you'll see here, we have some examples. At this time, we are an insert your change. Are you temporarily shortening your drop-off hours? Are you closing locations? Are you suspending curbside recycling? Let them know exactly what's happening and and that you'll keep them updated. You know, if, if there are scheduling changes happening, you probably don't have a current date in mind for when they're going to reopen. No one can say definitively right now that things will be back to normal on April 15th. But you can say, we're gonna do our absolute best to keep to get this back up and running as soon as possible when it's safe for all involved. Make sure to let them know that the change is temporary and reaffirm that all of the accepted materials have not changed in your community. And once again, provide a website that hosts the information and then update that site. The best thing you can do is keep all of your platforms updated with the most current information for your community. Now it's your turn to ask us some questions and you've been doing so. So we're gonna get to as many as we can. Cody, I have 87 open questions for us in our Q&A. But one trend that I'm seeing the most so far that I'd like to throw to you three is from the resident perspective, of the resident side, what are we seeing in terms of residents recycling right now? In this current climate, are we seeing residents recycling more, recycling less? What do we think it's gonna be the volumes or do we know? I've definitely, so this is Cody, and I've definitely been seeing the stories about volumes increasing. It makes a lot of sense, right? People are staying at home, their garbage and recycling are increasing. Um, cool, I actually saw you run a story that, that hit on this and shared some links to stories here in North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina specifically. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, um, anecdotal, we are definitely seeing this um, reports of uh, major volume increases on the residential side in multiple cities um i have not had a chance to dig into you know whether that's uh msw or recycling in particular but i think it's fair to assume right with folks you know home from work uh in many cases uh, there's going to be more more material in the blue bins um and also seen a lot of uh, spring cleaning activity which again is uh usually not stuff that should go in your blue bins unless it's uh, you know fits your guidelines but um, we're seeing a major uptick in uh, kind of home clean out projects and a lot of volume almost too much volume in some cases for uh cities to be dealing with and I'm seeing um, some questions that are coming through about bulky or yard waste collection. Um, wait, I'll just do a quick pause. For everybody that's asking questions, we're doing that in the Q&A part at the bottom of your screen. We're not answering the questions in the chat function if you came in late to the, the webinar. Um, but getting back to the question about the splint spring cleaning, I, we are talking to communities that are have contingency plans for schedule changes. So they might start with bulk, like suspending bulky collection, then yard waste before they have to kind of minimize their full suite of services to a community. So I think cities are really being smart about how to approach this. And it's interesting as volumes, um, definitely interesting as volumes increase. Trisha, is there uh, more kind of trending topics we can hit on? 
Yes, Cody. A great question came in from Brian Pugh. He said, what advice can you give to communities who have furloughed their recycling programs as they begin to think about bringing those programs back online after this is all over? Uh, I'll kick it off and say that um, we're always having to be in front of residents that, and, and trying to keep that trust up, right? And keeping the trust in the system. And so when you're ramping these programs back up, the best thing to do is to show the end game, show that this material is a feedstock and it's getting made into new things. It's important to supply. And, and people like to see that trans creation story, that transformation story of something being made into a new thing that kind of builds up that trust. Um, and know you're gonna have to have a budget behind it. You just can't do a few posts on social media that you're starting back up. You're really gonna have to try to back it up and, and, and get into all the media markets for people to truly understand how to use your program again. Um, Cole or Colin, any, any comments to that? Um, not, not specifically on, on my part. I think, um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's going to be a, a key part of this. We don't know how long these suspensions are going to go on, but of course, once they're over, uh, sort of getting things back going, uh, is going to be, you know, a, a big consideration. So I, I think that's definitely a worthy of consideration and, and good question, but, um, I'm not sure what I would advise specifically. Mm. And uh, I did want to touch on, we talked about labor um, and incentives for labor. And one thing that I really appreciated from Republic, uh, somebody from Republic mentioned that they, uh, they're they giving two additional PTO, uh, two additional weeks of PTO to their employees because of COVID-19. So some, some good stuff is happening out there, which is, uh, which we appreciate. Trisha, any, any more to hit on? We had another great question come in about looking ahead from this great, this pandemic here. We have Kevin Lugo. He asked about um, about um, a contracts coming up. You know, his contract is ending in a few months. And what can what advice do we have about moving forward with contracts and recommendations for building a new one with a Murph? Uh, Cole, do you, Cole or Colin, you guys have any comments? Um. I mean, I, I would say that, yeah, contracting, I think Cole mentioned at the beginning, contracting is kind of a key component here. Um, I would say industries across the country are facing higher costs and, and haulers, MRFs are no different beyond labor shortages. You know, haulers are seeing uh, uh, shifts in the stream, which will impact revenue. Um, more people staying home means more trash. I, I know that we were uh, looking into some of the resources Republic has, has put out there and you know, they've made some shifts in service and certainly seeing higher costs. So it's waste management. Uh, so far, those increases have not translated into, you know, asking municipalities for higher rates. It's obviously been very quickly over the past couple of weeks. So it's possible that could happen and this will play into it. Um, I know that waste management was quoted in an interview saying they are specifically, this is not going to, you know, cause them to raise rates specific to coronavirus. But as far as contracting in the future, how, how this kind of plays into that, I mean, it's, it seems likely that this is going to sort of follow the, the same trend we saw with China, where that was basically built, that the impact from the unprecedented shift in the China market was built into contracts and, and had a big impact. So however long this goes on, I think dictates um, the amount it plays into contracting in the future. Mm -hmm. Trisha. We got any more? We do, and a, this is both a question and also a plug. You know, Cole and Colin, we are getting lots of questions regarding, can you tell me one more time where I can find that again? Uh, Cole, will you start and tell us where our participants can find all of the information that you shared today on your website? Sure, um, the easiest way to do it is just go to wastedive.com and you'll find uh, all of our coronavirus coverage front and center there and you can sign up for our daily newsletter and also we do a weekly uh, recycling focus newsletter every Wednesday afternoon and you can sign up for that as well. Thank you. Colin, where can we find all the information you shared with us today? Yeah, we're, we're at resource-recycling.com and we've been covering this uh, in all three of our publications, Resource Recycling, Plastics Recycling Update, and eScrap News. And I would say it's, uh, it's impacting all three of those industries, municipal, plastics, and electronics in, in various kind of different ways. So we've been um, looking into all that and we do three newsletters a week uh, as well as print magazines. So you can subscribe on our website. Fantastic. And, 
And Tricia, I also want to say that that uh, Swana has been, if you don't get, and David, I don't want to speak for you, I hope I'm speaking okay here, that uh, th their newsletter that they put out and the information they put out is is is, is really local government, state, and, and industry focused, as well as ISRI. ISRI put out a checklist regarding this information, so those two organizations seem to have a, um, a, a real good um, finger on the pulse of this and providing resources as well, if you go to their websites. It's, it's very clear on their websites as well. And we at the Recycling Partnership are working on this as well, for you here as well. We've got some resources for you coming up here that were in our newsletter last week. And again, will be available on our recyclingpartnership.org slash COVID-19 page this week. A blog, Recycling While Social Distancing and how to talk to your residents about how they can commit to sustainability at home. Now that everyone's home with their families, this is a great time to relearn recycling basics and make sure that your residents have the, inf the information they need to recycle correctly in your community. For those of you who may not know, the Recycling Partnership is actually a fully remote team. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we all work at home. And we compiled our best tips for working remotely to share with all of you who may be doing this for the first time. Our number one tip across the board is to get out of your pajamas and take a look right now and you know who you are if this applies to you. You can check those out on our website. And if you have questions or would like to continue this conversation, please feel free to email webinars at recyclingpartnership.org. Spoiler alert, it's me on the other end of the line, and I'll make sure to connect you with whomever it is that you'd like to speak with regarding what's happening in your community. Cody? Thank you, Tricia. I, we have an overwhelming amount of questions here, and we tried to pull out the trends. Um, there are a lot of health questions, health specific. And I do want to just maybe before we leave, if you have questions about what to do with material um, uh, in a home that might have um, might have the virus in the home or questions about how long that material or virus might be on material or the safety of workers specifically around the virus, um, we recommend you really talk to your local health officials about those questions specifically. Um, we're definitely recyclers on our side. We're going to provide you uh, objective, clear information as the best we can. I know resource re uh, recycling and waste dive are doing the same, but don't be afraid to talk to your, your local health officials too if you have those types of questions. A lot of those came through. And then I think, uh, Trisha, we'll spend some time today and tomorrow uh, pulling together these questions. And when we send out the, the webinar, uh, we'll, we'll try to have some basic uh FAQs or, or Q&A type things within that recording for people to maybe, maybe we'll be able to hit on some. Is that fair, Tricia? Yes. Um, well, this is wonderful. Uh, are there, uh, Cole or Colin, you have any, well, let's just start with both of you. Any closing remarks for either of you? Cole, start with you. Sure. I um, just want to say thank you again, for, you know, for the chance to speak with everyone today. I um, already learned some stuff from, you know, the questions coming in and uh, some of the information in the chat chat box here. Um, and yeah, I think uh, definitely good advice to check with your local health officials. And again, to reiterate, as far as we know now, you know, the guidance is that it's not an imminent uh, risk for workers any more so than, you know, you're at risk um, going about your, your daily life is what, what we're hearing. Um, that said, things are changing quickly and we are seeing different guidance in other countries. So I think it's very important to stay, stay you know, closely attuned to this uh, for sure. And Colin. Yeah. Um, also, thanks for having me on. I, I hope everyone is uh, stays doing well um, out there in the audience. I I think one important thing that I would uh, reiterate is that the impacts are still coming out, and you know we're we're looking at a, a very different situation even two weeks from now. I we didn't get to talk about it much, but I think the supply issue is going to be a, a key factor here. There's a lag in time between collection cuts and, and when you start to see that supply. Uh, problems in, in the downstream processors. I, I haven't heard from reclaimers or processors that they're having supply issues yet, but in Europe, they, it was about two weeks out. So this week we're seeing collection cuts begin in a lot of cities. And I, I think that's going to be, uh, make for a very different landscape in two weeks from now. Well, I'd like to thank both of you. Uh, I'd like to thank both of your publications. Uh, Trisha, man, it is a pleasure hanging with you. And Again, want to just thank the, the people on this call, uh, your drivers, the people answering phones. It's, it's a kind of a, a wild time out there. And I, I'm just always pleased when there's stuff like this that pops up, uh, people come and, and support each other and collaborate. Um, 
and I'm always appreciative of that. So thank you for joining this webinar. We'll have resources. Uh, this is recorded. Uh, just look for stuff later this week. Tricia, we out? We out. Take care. Thank you.